Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very, very biased collection as usual. Um, today, a theorem which is called correspondence, so the Robinson sense set correspondence, and I will just call it RS correspondence because these names are really hard to pronounce. Anyway, so there's also a version which is called RSK, which would be the Robinson sense that Knuth correspondence. Uh, that's kind of a generalization of this picture, which I'm not going to touch upon. Um, you can Google it or have a look at the link to the description. Um, I quite a kind of claim if you understand, or if you understand together, this robinson Shenstedt correspondence. So the RS correspondence and the RSK correspondence is not much more difficult to understand. Anyway, that was a lot of waffle to uh, introduce the robinson Shenstedt correspondence, which is for me at least a funny relation between boxes and permutations. So correspondence here is kind of meant in the sense of bijection. We'll see what it is. Um, I think most people probably would know what a permutation is, and most people would know what a box is, but or boxes, what are, whatever. <laughs> but the relation between them is captured in the theorem. Um, so actually, there's part of it which I'm not going to explain. So the, the whole idea that there should be such a nice bijection originates in representation theory of, well, permutations, so the symmetric group, and kind of a nice indexing set of, of the simple representations of the symmetric group and character theory of the symmetric group. Uh, but we don't need, really need to know that to understand the relationship. And I will try to partially motivate by completely ignoring representation theory of symmetric groups, where it actually comes from, um, in the sense of like a numerical coincidence. The numerical coincidence itself uh, was known a long time before the Romish and Shenstedt correspondence was written down. And it came from, as I tried to explain, and I completely failed, of course, um, came from the representation theory of symmetric groups. So also it looks a little bit like a surprising numerical coincidence. Um, there's a reason why, right? So surprises usually, numerical surprises usually come from some, whatever, deep uh, fact or something. And, the only thing I'm trying to say here in this very long introduction is that I'm not going to touch upon the uh, deep background, whatever deep means, whatever background means, but just present you the robinson sensed correspondence in the vacuum, which is still a lot of fun. So we will see some, some fun animations. I should get started by now, right? So let's get started. Uh, so what I would like to talk about first are young diagrams. And the young diagram is a very, very simple idea and it turns out to be a very powerful idea. Yet again, it comes from the representation theory of symmetric groups, so that's where it originates. So uh, Young was doing research on those about 120 years ago. Uh, don't quote me on that, it's probably 120 years plus minus 10 or something, but, but roughly, uh, uh, well, around the beginning of the 20th century, I guess. Uh, so, and the idea is as follows. So you just fix some number. So here, let's say I have nine, n equals nine. And you put nine boxes arranged in this kind of pattern. So boxes arranged in a left, uh, left justified. So you start somewhere, left justified, and you would have would like to have non-increasing rows. So here, first row has five boxes, two boxes, one box, one box. That's good. Five boxes, four boxes, perfectly fine. Four boxes, five boxes is not allowed. Okay. So you want it to be non-increasing. Uh, something like this would be perfectly fine as well. Well, for n equals four in this case. So uh, non-increasing really means you can have rows of the same lengths. Just the next one, um, so if you read from bot top to bottom, the next one should be not longer. It can be of the same lengths, but not longer. And these things are called Young diagrams. And they turn out to appear everywhere, mostly in combinatorics and, or a surprise, in the representation theory of the symmetric group. I should warn you, kind of fun story. I don't quite know where it originates, but there are at least three conventions for Young diagrams. There's a convention I use, which is called the English convention, which reads in this in this fashion. So um, I have a five row, I have a two row, I have a one row and a one row, and I just read in this fashion and I want it to be non-increasing in the sense I explained. And then there's a French convention, which decided to read kind of this way, um, so this one here would be a completely allowed French Young diagram, but it's it's a not allowed English Young diagram. So French and English just swaps it around. And then there's also the Russian convention. I'm not going to use French or Russian, don't worry. Uh, but just to warn you that whatever you look it up, you might see a different convention. 
There's also the Russian convention, which is, I think, the le less popular, and it uses some form of illustrating them, like hanging at a point, and then you get those big type of pictures here. So instead of anchoring like, like I do, you just anchor it here and read somewhere like that. That's a Russian convention. Anyway, that's just a warning. And I really would like to know where all of those conventions come from. Um, uh, by the way, uh, so in most of France or the French speaking literature, they use the French convention and the most of the English speaking literature, they use the English convention. And I've never checked the Russian speaking literature I should have as a preparation for, for this video, but I failed. Uh, anyway, I would really like to know where it comes from uh, in case someone knows. But just as a warning here, there are different conventions. That was again a lot of raffle to just say, we have those nice box arrangements and you need to believe me here kind of as a black box that those box arrangements well, play a huge role in mathematics. Kind of an easy idea to arrange boxes. We need a little bit of more information and again, those things play a huge role in mathematics. So we just take our boxes and we fill our boxes with numbers. Uh, so I just fill in the numbers one to n in our boxes. So here n was nine. So I fill in the numbers one to nine and I want it in a non-repeating fashion. So every number should appear. So one, two, three, four, five, and so on. One, two, three, four, five, and so on, and so on. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And as another condition, I want it to be uh, increasing along rows and columns. So if I read along my row here, I would like to see increasing numbers. One, four, five, seven, eight. That's good. If I read along columns, I would like to see increasing numbers. One, two, three, nine, uh, four, six, right? Two, six, and so on. Well, this one is a little bit boring and those guys are a little bit boring, but I hope you get the point. So here, for example, this is a non-example because I will see one, four, seven, five, eight, and that's non-increasing. Uh, this is also not allowed because I have repetition. So one, four, five, five, eight would also be not allowed. And whatever you get, there are quite a few of them. If you try to list them for n equals nine, there are quite a few of them. Um, the, but whatever you get is called a standard Young tableau or just a standard tableau. And um, these things play a huge role in combinatorics. And it turns out that there is a funny count, which as I said, comes from representation theory. Um, but you can just do it naively by just counting those things. And if you want, you can actually look at uh, the number of those up in the uh, online integer sequence. Um, and you will see the following. So I've listed here. So these are all young diagrams. Diagrams is without fillings for n equals four. So with four boxes, I have the, well, the row, I have the column, and I have hook, sh hook, hook type sh shapes and the box type shape. And then I list all young tableau, so all fillings of those. Um, you could convince yourself that here, I mean, here there's nothing to do because you want the row to be increasing. So you just fill it in one, two, three, four. Same here, you want the column to be increasing. So you just fill it in one, two, three, four. Um, here you can play around with those two. And here, if you think about it, and here's the same. Here, if you think about it a little bit, you can kind of place your favorite number down here except one because one needs to be kind of centered upstairs uh, to the northwest because, well, you still have this condition on increasing rows and columns and you can't place one anywhere else. Okay, so when you count those numbers, so one, three, two, three, one, and you square them. So one squared plus two squared uh, plus three squared plus two squared, Ooh, complicated, oh, sorry, uh, plus another three squared, so I got, got this a little bit wrong, uh, plus one squared. So we have two threes, I hope I get it correct. So two threes, we have two ones. Here's a one, here's a one, here's a one, here's a one. And there should be a two, so perfect. And if you do this calculation, which I hope for, well, I know the answer, so I don't need to do it. Uh, you can double check whether I have messed up. It should be 24, which is uh, four factorial. And this is true in general. So if I would do it for n equals five, I would get five factorial by squaring the number of those. If I would do it for n equals six, I would get six factorial, seven factorial, and so on. So pairs of young tableau count permutations. Said otherwise, pairs here because I square them, right? I have one and another one. And this was kind of well known for about 50 years. This count, uh, it's a very curious count. And the Robert and Chenstedt correspondence then finds an explicit bijection. So this count says there's a set, a set of permutations, and there's a set, the set of pairs of those young tableau, and they have the same size. 
Um, so there should be a nice bijection and the Robertson sensor correspondence finds exactly that bijection. Okay, I will run it in a second for you live or the two methods to do it. But for now, I just state the result. So there are explicit bijections or that explicit inverse from permutations to pairs of young tableau. And usually that denote by P and Q. So we have a P tableau and a Q tableau. And I said again, pairs, and that's why you square those numbers, right? I had three squared, two squared, and so on. And that's because I have pairs. And there's also an explicit inverse. Um, and all of these have some nice properties, which I'm not going to touch upon. But this is a really cool uh, theorem in combinatorics because permutations, I mean, permutations, we don't have to say anything about permutations. The symmetric group, the symmetric group is everywhere, card shuffling and so on. And you have a different way of thinking about it by using this bijection, which is really cute, actually, um, to this pair of young tableau. And really, really good. And there are two very nice ways of doing it. There's a bumping way and there's a geometric way. Uh, whatever geometric means. And I'm going to explain that in an example. And I claim if you understand the example and you do maybe one example yourself, it's really not so hard. And certainly you can uh, do it easily. It's beautiful, it's beautifully simple. And for a machine, of course, uh, this is trivial. This is breakfast, as you will see. Actually, I will run a machine for you. Uh, so let's have a look. Um, so the theorem just says the set of permutations, the set of elements of Sn, so Sn itself is in bijection with those pairs of Young tableau, which gives you a really different way of thinking about permutations. And that's then kind of by default, a very powerful theorem uh, in practice. And the two algorithms that I would like to present here are Schenstedt's original algorithm and the one due to Vino. Uh, so Schenstedt is a bumping one, which I'm going to run in a second. And Vino is a grid one on the right-hand side, respectively, the bumping one on the left-hand side, which I'm also going to run in a second. Basically, the bumping one works as follows. We'll see that in action. So you, you have over, it's, it's uh, inductively. So you have over the tableau constructed, and you need to put in another number. So you want to put in four here somewhere, and the spot where it fits is where the five is. So you need to put, but you need to take out the five because you kind of replace the five. So then you need to put in the five and you will find a spot for the five and you need to take out whatever you, you've seen before and you keep on going until you find a nice free spot for the last element. And that's why it's called bumping. Again, it's a four bumps out the five, the five bumps out the eight and the eight then just gets stuck. And on the other side is this grid construction which works as also very nicely works as follows. So you can read off the different uh, rows and columns. So this is the P tableau, this is the Q tableau. Um, as follows, you put your permutation on a grid. So here one goes to three, two goes to eight, three goes to one, four goes to two, five goes to four and so on, six goes to seven. I'm getting a bit tired. Seven goes to five, eight goes to six. Okay. You just put it on a grid and you kind of remember where the points are. And then you draw those lines to those point, to, to the first point, you start here, go to the first point, and you want to go to the second point and you make this little um, edge and whatever. So you end up with one, you put a one in the first entry, you end up with one in this case as well, you put a one. Uh, you do the same for the next one, you will see here two and two, so you put two and two. The next one will produce a five, five, and you will end at four, four, and then six and eight, six and eight, and so on. And the next row is then given by going to the corners of the previous one. So here's a corner, here's a corner of the previous one, and you do the same game. And then the next one will go to the corners of the previous one. So it's also an inductive construction. It's most illustrative to see it in action. So let's have a look. So here's a beautiful website linked in the description, which um, just illustrates a bumping algorithm. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click on those blue numbers to construct a permutation. So here's a trivial permutation, for example. Okay, and the trivial permutation gives me the very boring uh, pair of young tableau. Okay, that's not so bad. And we can actually just restart. So let's do a more fancy permutation. Maybe I want like to one to four. So I put a box labeled four and a box labeled one. Um, so this will this will bump and this will record. So bump and record the blue uh, the black one blue one the black one will record. So two four okay. So let's put in a five. A five finds a natural place, so just put it where it is. No bumping. As soon as you find a natural place, no bumping. 
um, and record where the five, well, where the five actually ended. So same for the six. The six just goes where it is, right? So, but now we'll have will be some bumping because, for example, the one. Where can I put the one? Well, the one needs to bump down the four, and I re record where this happens. And the two needs to bump down the five, and the three needs to bump down the six. Huh? Make some sense? So let's have another restart. Let's do something really fancy. Let's do this one. Put a six first, and now everything needs to bump the six. So the three needs to bump the six. Well, okay. The four sticks naturally. The two needs to bump the three again, and you record what happens. The one needs to bump the two, and the five then sticks naturally um, uh, in the last spot. So here's the geometric construction, which I'm running on uh, the Wikipedia page. Really nice animation. Um, and we'll see it start over in a second. So this will be the outcome. OK, so here goes. So we have this permutation. One goes to three, two goes to eight, and so on. You just put in the points, as I said before. And now you just draw those lines, right? So first line, uh, second line, and then the third line is boring, the, the fourth line and the fifth line. And you read off the numbers that you see and construct the first tableau and construct the second. And then you, well, look at the corners. So here's a corner, here's a corner, here's a corner, and draw in this, the next layer. So blue, blue, and you read off the numbers, what, four, three and four, seven, and you put them in the next row of the tableau. You have one more corner to go, uh, your green one, and this will be the last row. So read off seven and eight, and that's exactly what you put in the last row. So these are the two algorithms. Um, but both linked in the description. Really beautiful. As soon as you have done it once by hand, it's really clear and it's an extremely beautiful by direction um, between very, very different objects. All right, let me summarize. So the Robert Chutensid correspondence, after roughly 50 years, realized the formula, which was known in representation theory for, as I said, 50 years. And uh, it's a really beautiful bijection between two very different looking beasts symmetric groups on one side and this pair of young tableaus on the other side. Um, I haven't showed you the inverse. The inverse is not much harder. So both of those procedures have nice inverses um, that you can also run. So you can also associate easily to a pair of young tableau uh, permutation. And that's, I think, a very nice theorem and that's, or a very nice construction if you want. And that's why it ended on this list. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.